ladies and gentlemen, really great pleasure to be here at one of my favorite meetings. Uh, I call this shrinking the gray zone, you'll see why. That's Toronto looking its best. So we published now 15 years ago this paper, which in retrospect was kind of pivotal. Uh, a group of patients that we started managing with surveillance prospectively beginning in around uh, 1997 with informed consent. It was considered experimental, highly risky. We've learned a lot since then. We know uh, the, the problem of overtreatment's been alluded to. No one disputes this. We know much more about the bad actors, the nature of who has the, who, of, of the occult high-grade disease, the misclassification of risk. We know about the predictive value of baseline parameters. We've talked about that a lot. Actually, clinical parameters, just the, the extent of disease, PSA density, race, age, and so on, are quite useful. We know about the flaws of PSA kinetics. Most groups, including ours, used a rapid PSA rise as a trigger for intervention. That was not a good strategy. It resulted in a lot of overtreatment. We use it now as a trigger for further evaluation, but not treatment. Multiparametric MRI is a game changer. New modeling studies that show basically it's a very robust approach, even if the mortality rate starts to creep up with longer follow-up. And more than now, more than 2,000 publications. I don't know if you can see that's from a Medline search of active surveillance in prostate cancer. It's, it's really an area of very intensive investigation all over the world. Now, I hope I'm, I'm less sure now than I was 20 minutes ago hearing some of Dave Crawford's comments, but I think what we know and almost everyone agrees with is that Gleason 3 and Gleason 4 are like night and day that the molecular genetics of most Gleason 3 is normal. The metastatic potential is approximately zero. I have spent the last 10 years trying to collect cases of pathologically characterized Gleason 6 that have metastasized. I'm not convinced there's one really well characterized patient where he had a radical P, only Gleason 6 by contemporary standards who went on to metastatic disease. Even if there is a handful, it doesn't matter whereas Gleason 4 has all the molecular hallmarks of cancer. And the major Achilles heel, uh, the limitation of surveillance is that we underestimate uh, higher grade cancer, which is present in around 25 to 30 percent of these patients. Doesn't mean it's all, it's all going to result in the death of the patient if it's left untreated, but it certainly puts them at higher risk. In contrast, true biologic grade progression where the patient's Gleason 3 progresses to a 4 or 5 is much less common. And our estimate based on serial biopsies and Hopkins has come up with, about, with the same estimate is that this occurs in about 1% of cases per year, usually in a large field of Gleason 3. So that's one of the significances of volume of 3. Uh, you do get prehistologic adverse genetic alterations. Dave comments on the 20% that are bad. It, that doesn't mean the patient's going to die of prostate cancer if he's left untreated. So we still have to learn what the significance of those prehistologic molecular changes are. And uh, finally, we're in the MRI and biomarker era. I'm not going to go into that in much detail. Uh, I used to talk about how there were these two diverse pathways of genetic development of three, which was a proliferative pathway, versus four and five, which is a dysplastic pathway, kind of like bladder cancer. But there's increasing evidence now that the differences are more uh, quantitative than qualitative. This is a recent study by Mark Rubin that looks at gen genomic alterations. And you can see Gleason 3s on the left, and you, uh, you move through to higher grade cancer. The, the alterations are there, you can see here. But they're much fewer, and the amplitude uh, is much less. And so uh, clearly, this is partly a matter of degree. Uh, one example of this is P10 loss, which we heard about. P10 is considered one of the key events in progression of prostate cancer, the loss of P10. And this study uh, from Hopkins showed that P10 loss, while it did occur in Gleason 3, it almost all occurred these were a group of patients with Gleason 7 cancer. It almost all occurred in the Gleason 3 that was associated with higher grade cancer. In other words, P10 loss was very rare 
in 3 plus 3 alone or 3 plus only a small amount of uh, 4. So you can see that here, the, the P10, it's, uh, this is Gleason 6 in the white. Uh, that's one observation that I'm going to provide an explanation to. And this is this well-known paper case report by Hafner, the guy who had a radical P and then died 17 years later. And they did uh, whole genome sequencing from multiple bone mats in every subarea in his prostate. And the surprising thing was the molecular homology between the little microfocus of Gleason 6 and the metastasis not the extensive Gleason 4. So does this mean, you know, Gleason 3 can really be a metastatic cancer? Well, here's the explanation I like. And we heard about exosomes earlier. And the thing that wasn't mentioned about the exosomes, which has been learned in the last three or four years, is that these exosomes contain RNA, and they are, in, they are shed thousands per day by each cell, each cancer cell shedding these exosomes, and they're taken up by neighboring cells, they're also in the circulation, they're taken up by distant cells, and they adversely influence the biologic behavior of those cells. So this has been shown in animal models. A high-grade prostate cancer converts a low-grade cancer in the other flank to a more aggressive phenotype. It's like a, a kid that's been raised well with good values, goes into a bad neighborhood and falls under the influence of a, of a gang and becomes a drug dealer. And this has huge implications for all kinds of things that we do, I think. Uh, but it also explains the Hafner case, and it explains how P10 loss is more common in 3 when it's associated with 4. It's, it's probably at least in part related to this extracellular, extracellular vesicle transfer or exosome uh, uptake that contains adverse RNA that adversely affects the cell. We just had this discussion. I believe that Gleason 6 doesn't have metastatic potential. It's still a cancer. It can invade, just like gliomas, just like basal cell cancers. Doesn't metastasize, has the characteristics of cancer. We're not going to change the name, but it's a non-metastasizing cancer. Very important concept. If it doesn't metastasize, why do we care about the volume? Uh, for those of you who were there at uh, Dave Crawford's session at uh, from 6 to 7 this morning, he talked about this 48-year-old who had extensive Gleason 6, and he operated on him. And he considered this, you know, as a victory of the diagnostic algorithm. Frankly, I don't know why he operated on him. Because that guy, there's no way that patient had uh, higher-grade cancer. He'd been so thoroughly evaluated. Uh, you don't have to treat a patient with high-volume Gleason 6, but you have to look hard to make sure that they don't have anything more. It's a marker for the presence of higher-grade cancer. This is uh, one meta-analysis that shows papers that have looked at this, predicting for disease reclassification, which basically means upgrading, PSA density, which is a surrogate for cancer volume, race, uh, in most papers, is predictive for an increased risk of higher grade cancer, extent of core involvement, number of cores, and so on. So, so that's the significance of higher volume six. You have to re-scrutinize that patient. MRI, perhaps template biopsies, whatever your preferred approach is. There's a range, there's about uh, uh, nine or 10 prospective, large prospective series now in the literature. There's a range of selection criteria, and there's really two extremes. We were at run at one extreme because we included 3 plus 4 or PSA between 10 and 20. The Hopkins group was the other extreme. Only Epstein criteria, one or two positive cores, no more than 50% involvement, low PSA density. And the others sort of fall in between these two extremes. So we now have a lot of data from these series that allow us to define what the risk is with these different criteria. Uh, just uh, uh, so we had about, we had 22% who were intermediate risk, either Gleason 7 or PSA above 10. These were mostly older patients, but more than a third were under age 70. And we now have, with long follow up, 30 patients out of 1,000, 3% have developed metastases, 15 prostate cancer deaths, 1.5%. And uh, so that's, that's a, a meaningful uh, experience, and we've learned something from that. Just to emphasize, the, this was a publication that just came out from uh, Toronto showing that the 
uh, eligibility criteria for surveillance don't really influence the likelihood of being treated. So this is, shows all these different groups, they each have their own intervention criteria, and basically about 25 to 30 percent are treated by five years. So this is our data, and we had out here an actuarial 15-year prostate cancer mortality of 5 percent, and this was published about a year and a half ago. And, you know, I used to think, gee, we've done so well, 95% of these prostate cancer patients have had long-term survival free of progression. And then, uh, so, so we started to look at how we could predict for the patients who had metastasis, and essentially the presence of Gleason 4 at baseline was an incredibly powerful predictor for progression to metastatic disease. So this shows uh, cause-specific survival by low versus intermediate risk, 3% versus 11%, a hazard ratio for metastatic progression of almost four. Very, very meaningful. And this shows that it was all the Gleason. The PSA above 10 really had no significant, imp slight, but not, not really very significant impact on likelihood of metastasis, whereas the presence of Gleason 4, huge impact. And this is the most compelling data. This is recursive partitioning analysis, breaking the Gleason, the, the patients down into each little subgroup. So Gleason 6 on the left, they all did fine. Gleason 7, uh, any Gleason pattern 4, result in at least a 20% 15-year prostate cancer metastasis rate, despite close monitoring, treatment if they looked like they were getting worse, and so on. Uh, you see down here is the, the best group, PSA less than 10, uh, percent of cancer less than a third, uh, 3 plus 4, 30% metastasis rate at 15 years. So we have become more restrictive as a result of that, less enthusiastic about surveillance for Gleason 3 plus 4, notwithstanding that biomarkers and MRI are playing a, a role in some of these patients. Now, in contrast to us, you had the Hopkins group, uh, restrictive approach, Epstein criteria only, 0.5% prostate cancer mortality at 15 years. So in a sense, that's a victory. They did better. We had 3%, we had actuarial 5%, but actually only 1.5% only, uh, mortality overall. Uh, so you've got these two extremes. We can offer surveillance with our historic approach to 50%. They offer it to about 20%. And clearly there's a middle road. The middle road is be more restrictive about Gleason 7, but less, less more inclusive about Gleason 6. And my understanding, uh, Alan may correct this, is that um, the Hopkins group is now more inclusive about Gleason 6 beyond Epstein. So there's kind of been a convergence of approaches. Now, now, true, he says. Now we're in the MRI era. So this is an example I like. This is a guy who had a systematic biopsy showing one positive core, Gleason 3 plus 3, had this MRI. I don't know. There's the lesion. Uh, anterior, you would, you would, there's no way you would pick this up with a systematic biopsy. Four plus three on targeted biopsy. Here's the pathology. There's his Gleason four plus three cancer. Uh, you know, so, I mean, this speaks volumes. Without MRI, this guy would have remained on surveillance and maybe he would have been one of the ones who did badly. So MRI. The main point, this is a summary of the performance of MRI, this, this field is on fire. Like there's a new MRI paper every single month with more data. Uh, the NPV for clinically significant cancer, which is the key metric here, it's quite variable, anywhere from 65% or so to 100%. I just want to focus on this Pana Bianco paper published about a year ago. Uh, 1,140 patients, a randomized study NPV 100, there was not a single patient with a negative MRI who had clinically significant cancer on subsequent uh, systematic biopsies and 99% positive predictive value. Uh, we haven't done so well. I'm actually presenting this data for the first time. This is a study we just finished called the ASSIST study. 
a randomized study in men on surveillance randomized between systematic biopsy and MRI with targeted and systematic biopsy. We wanted to see if the MRI was negative, could we forego the biopsy? No difference in the rate of upgrading between the two arms. The upgrading was achieved with only two cores in the MRI group versus 12 cores in the systematic biopsy group. But look at our performance of the MRI. And this is a multi-center study. It's more of a real-world study, I would say. Positive predictive value for PIRADS-5 was 33%. It was 99% in Pana Bianco study. Positive predictive value for 4 was in the same ballpark. Negative predictive value, 85% versus 100%. Around around 8% of our patients with a negative MRI had Gleason 7 or higher. So, uh, and this just shows the data. This is the targeted biopsy group, no cancer Gleason 6. 8% uh, had systematic biopsy with Gleason 7 and 6% the other way around. So, I don't know about MRI. It, it works, it adds a lot. It's not, I don't think, as good as some of the literature suggests. Uh, it's also got a role in men on, on surveillance in follow-up. This is a typical example, a stable lesion, Gleason 6, down here. Here it is a year later. It hasn't changed. That has to mean something versus progression on MRI. So I think increasingly it's been incorporated into, into the longitudinal follow-up in these patients, although we're still waiting for outcome on this. So, Biomarkers. Now, I am not going to add to the extensive discussion we've had, except I want to show one piece of data that didn't get discussed uh, this morning. I thought it was a fantastic session. This was published a few months ago by Way. They did whole exome sequencing in a small group of patients who had multifocality. So each, this, these are four different patients, and these are f uh, different cancers within the same prostate. And they, because it was whole genome sequencing, they could look at the genes that are incorporated into Oncotype GX, Prolaris, Decipher. And what do you see? Surprise, surprise. Heterogeneity. Look at this. I mean, uh, this patient. Very negative versus very positive. Uh, most, of the, most of the signals are in the same direction, but big difference in amplitude. So, you know, in the, in the debate, which we've been alluding to between MRI and biomarkers, which is best, when, when should they be used? To me, the heterogeneity issue continues to be devil assays based on assessment of individual biopsy cores, and this is some evidence that that's, that's the case. But however these pan out, we're into the era of image-based molecular paradigm. Many, many advantages to this. It reassures the patient. I'm sure we're going to reduce that 15-year uh, mortality rate from 3 or 4% to less than 1% by early identification of the bad actors. My belief is that most of those patients who metastasized had large anterior cancers that we completely missed. A lot of them had already metastasized at the time of diagnosis, or at least per perhaps they were amenable to cure. Uh, but weren't treated early enough. So that, that is going to change dramatically as we incorporate these, uh, these new tests. Guidelines. This, I think, is kind of relevant in the context of the biomarker we've discussion, the biomarker discussion we had this morning. So here is our guideline, the ASCO guideline, which basically adopted the Cancer Care Ontario guideline word for word with one exception, and the NICE guidelines. So they're pretty consistent, you know, uh, serial biopsy, PSA, other tests. Our approach was MRI when clinical and pathologic findings are discordant. Uh, ASCO, other tests remain investigational, both MRI and biomarkers. NICE says everyone should have, a bi have an MRI. They've gone out on a limb with that. Uh, five ARIs was the one area. We said it may have a role. ASCO said no clear role. NICE doesn't comment on it. Uh, biomarkers have not been incorporated into these guidelines as of yet. Maybe that will change in the next couple of years. Just to show uptake, this is uh, six or seven different um, studies, uh, and basically all over the world, New Hampshire, Michigan, the music collaboration, Australia. This is uh, Capture, Matt Cooperberg in the yellow, 
This is Sweden, more than 90% of very low risk patients managed with, managed with surveillance. And this was just published from Canada, very proud of this. This is uptake of surveillance in low risk patients by individual center. You can see is at least about 65%, in some cases more than 95%. So, you know, uh, the, the pattern is there. Actually, this is the same slide. Uh, finally, I just want to um, talk briefly about some things that you can do, the opportunity to improve the health of the patient on surveillance. So, you know, a lot of these guys, you have a healthy 60-year-old found to have microfocal Gleason 6. Um, you may be the first doctor he's seen in years, and there's an opportunity to intervene. Uh, the obvious things, and, uh, smoking cessation, weight loss. This was a study that Ian Thompson just published that showed, uh, you, you, know, you know, you might think, you tell the patient, okay, you got prostate cancer, you need to improve your health, no change in weight after the diagnosis of prostate cancer in, in their cohort. Um, this was a study called Active Holistic Surveillance that was published recently. Uh, Aaron Katz, probably some of you know, uh, some of the advice that they give to patients, uh, broccoli, omega-3, this is an anti-inflammatory, uh, Jenna Kinoko, whatever that is, et cetera. I mean, you can, you, can, you can get really carried away with this stuff, but uh, certainly patients like to hear about this. Uh, exercise, long story, we're going to hear about that tonight probably, but many ways in which exercise may delay the progression of prostate cancer. This is quite an interesting review article published recently, Enhancing Active Surveillance of Prostate Cancer, the Potential of Exercise Medicine, uh, for anyone who's interested. And this is, this is just a list of the lifestyle studies that are currently ongoing in men on surveillance, and not to go into detail, but, but there's, there's huge interest in this area of intervening with some kind of lifestyle, diet, micronutrient intervention during this period to reduce the risk of uh, progression. We're doing a metformin study in surveillance in Toronto. So finally, the gray zone. So I would say until about 2012 maybe, and the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force recommendation which influenced practice, this was the gray zone, it was huge. Almost everything we did was in the gray zone. T1A, you know, microfocal 6 after a TERP, no one was treating that. Uh, but but the rest, you could do whatever you wanted. Now the gray zone has shrunk. And I think it's fair to say for most people, most people think low volume Gleason 6 should not be treated. Higher volume, higher grade disease rather should be treated. And now the gray zone is the patients with extensive disease, Gleason 6, very young men under 50, small amount of Gleason 7, there's a debate about what, uh, small amount of Gleason four in Gleason 7 patients. The patient who's got a restricted diffusion on his MRI, but low grade on biopsy, I don't know what to do with those guys. High PSA density is also kind of a red flag. Clearly we have a ways to go. We incorporate biomarkers, uh, personalized medicine, ideally no more gray zone. We know exactly what to do, what the risk in each patient is, how aggressively to treat them. So that's the goal. And uh, I will conclude there. Thank you very much.